Hello, everyone out there in podcast world. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Uh, you're listening to or watching the Service Business Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Hirsch Blissett, sitting virtually next to my co-host, Joshua Crouch. Uh, today, we're going to talk about something that we both uh, kind of nerd out about. Uh, it's it's very weird because when we talk about automation or, or anything about uh, productivity hacking and that type of stuff, and you, and you mix that with service businesses and home service businesses, a lot of times they're like, Okay, so how do I, how do, where I, do I start? Yeah, where, where do I, where's, and how do I do this for a, a business where we're actually getting out there and touching the equipment and doing all that stuff? And so I'm super, I mean, <laughs> Josh and I, we're trying our very best not to fanboy here, but um, RMI Zell has, has implement, has influenced both of our businesses extremely, uh, an extreme amount. And uh, so our businesses, remote virtual like we paperless all the all the good stuff and literally it would not be possible without this book that we got from uh it's the replaceable founder that um i got from ari and then i ended up uh picking up his several other books too and i have i actually have one on the way that won't be here till tomorrow but um <laughs> it's been like guess what i got josh look oh look at you man you mm -hmm. fancy you fancy yep 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 so <laughs> yeah he signed my book uh but anyways we literally uh talk about automation constantly we get asked constantly about automation so uh, well Josh, and, the, and the yeah and the thing with automation is <clears throat> uh people don't know where to start and i think what what ari's book and, and some of his processes have allowed not only me to dive deeper in for my own business, but to help people with is you have to figure out what are those things that you can either delegate to a person or, you know, we need to develop a process and enhance that process. There's, there's multiple steps here in that, that overall scheme of becoming more efficient, especially mm -hmm. as the business owner, like what are you wasting time on that somebody else could do for you? And if you can hand it off, do you have a process for them to follow dude and i that think was that's one of where the biggest things like when we when i was listening i think it was this one. actually no it wasn't it was this one it's uh <laughs> uh <laughs> i'm productive uh it's it's seriously it was i failed at delegating because i was like aptitude uh what's it oh shoot i'm having a brain fart anyways i literally just handed off my delegation to someone else and you didn't have a process for it right it wasn't perfected and then julie and i are listening to this on on uh audiobook and he was like she was like oh that's why we failed at it we should have gone through had a va write it out have somebody actually do it see the steps that were failing then have a va you know redo the the whole process and we we're like oh dang like that's like, anyways, let's just get started with the show because we could talk about this for hours without him, but we have him sitting here waiting on us. So, <laughs> Are you looking for valuable business advice to reach that seven figure revenue mark? Do you want actionable tips to properly navigate through every business challenge you encounter along the way? Let Tersh Blissett and Josh Crouch be your guide in getting you to the top here at Service Business Mastery. Tune in as they sit down with world-renowned authors in business, leadership, and personal growth who share valuable insights about management, marketing, pricing, human resources, and so much more. Let their nuggets of wisdom gold guide you in owning a thriving, profitable, and ever-growing business. Here are your hosts, Tersh and Josh. Hey, Ari. Welcome to the show, man. Welcome, Ari. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So for those who have been living under a rock and have no idea, you, uh, <laughs> uh, a quick introduction and, and share, you know, what makes you so like, I mean, you've not. OK, so Josh and I didn't even talk about everything that you have overcome in life to get you to where you're at. Um, and I think that that's a very important story for people to understand as well. Sure. Um, so basically, I was working in construction when I got out of college and uh, in upstate New York. And f for a number of reasons, I was I was living a very stressful lifestyle. I mean, it, I was young. It was my first really big real estate project. And I was sort of learning on the go. And I was learning like every trade there was. Mm -hmm. And when I was 23, I got diagnosed with Crohn's disease. 
which is a chronic inflammatory condition that affects the digestive tract. It's considered to be incurable. And uh, long story short, basically went from working 18 hour days to work an hour a day. Mm. And I had already racked up about $3 million in personal debt at that point on this project at 23. And I, I couldn't work. I was, I was too sick. Uh, I got really, really sick very quickly. And eventually I was able to overcome the illness, even though it is considered being curable. But I had to figure out a way to get more done in that one hour. And that uh, really has served as the basis for everything that's sort of come since then, all the coaching and books and speaking and everything is what would you do if you only had an hour a day? And, you know, if you only had an hour a day, it's really not about what would you do is what wouldn't you do? And if the things that you still need or if the, the things that you wouldn't be able to do still need to get done, then who or what is going to do them for you? And that's where the whole framework of optimize, automate, outsource uh, was born and less doing began. And then since then, I've been uh, speaking, coaching, writing books, and, you know, ended up on the service business mastery podcast. <laughs> that's probably yeah. the highlight right there. I'm sure it's, it's every day. <laughs> Yeah, so it was it was really cool. Whenever I uh, I first met Ari, um, it was at a CEO Warrior event, and we were in New Jersey, and uh, it was a, a dinner event, I think, where it was it was pretty intimate. I mean, there wasn't a lot of people there, and then uh, we came into the room, and they had like these books, the Replaceable Founder books, sitting down, and I was like, oh, this is cool. Like, I had been dab, I mean, I had been dabbling in Trello and other stuff like that and trying to really figure out how to automate things. Uh, but I didn't know what it meant to automate and I didn't know what it meant to delegate or being a replaceable founder. And then as soon as Ari starts talking, I'm like, Oh my gosh, like this is where it's at. Like this is it. And, and a lot of what, like the automatic, um, the auto responses that, that anybody that, that that reaches out to us on the podcast, but they get an auto responder and it tells them, hey, look, I only I only checked my email twice a day. Uh, so if this is an emergency, please call the office and uh, all this other stuff. A lot of our inbox getting rid of our inbox like this is like uh all of this stuff is stuff that I've, I've i've learned from ari but with that being said i'll let you talk ari because i this is this is about you not me Tersh is blushing man no i i literally <laughs> like am just i'm excited i want people to be as excited about this as i am so <laughs> do you really check your email twice a day um no 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 that's not <laughs> oh, look at his face it, it is a hundred percent to limit expectations of the person that is emailing me so that's a this is a good one so this is a great place for us to start we can become really fast friends or enemies your choice um <laughs> we, the uh so one of the things i've often said is that whenever you get a autoresponder from somebody that says that they check their email twice a day that they're probably full of uh yeah crap Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not a reasonable expectation to set anyway, because basically you're e either somebody's not going to believe you and they're just going to send another email or something like that. Or, well, I, I, so I won't go on this too deep, but email is like a really hot topic for me. So one of the oh, things I, know, is yeah. I, I was approached by a, a colleague, a productivity, this woman is a really excellent productivity coach, um, totally different system and methodology than mine, but I, I really respect what she does. And she sent me an email asking me if I could participate in her new project. And I wrote back and I got a response, an autoresponder from her saying like emails, you know, emails not working for me. Uh, I'm not going to be responding, you know, anytime soon with email, whatever. And immediately I was like, that's weird. You know, like she's a productivity huh. person. And, uh, and then of course she emailed me back about 10 minutes later. I was like, <laughs> okay, well, so now the whole thing is just BS. Uh, yeah. And that completely changes the conversation and the tone that happens after that. So uh, if you do that, and you tell people you only check it twice a day, you either have to really do it, which I don't recommend, by the way. I check my email probably 50 or 60 times a day, which people always find really surprising, right? That's because I'm a productivity person, but my email actually is productive. So if you're actually doing email properly and using it for the powerful tool that yeah. it is, then uh, you, there's no reason why you should only check it twice a day. And furthermore, at that point, I would rather just tell people like, hey, I don't do email. If you wanna get in touch, like either contact me this way or contact this person for this need, this person for this need, this one for this need, and just don't use email. 
So, I mean, I know that you, you only keep about what, 10 emails in your inbox every day. No, I mean, I got zero right now. Oh, okay. Um, But like, (laughs) of course you have zero. Explain that process. Uh, And and so here's what I dealt with. And I've dealt with this here recently, actually. uh, And that is creating an optional uh, um, folder. Yeah, it's the, there were some, there are some communications that are ending up in optional that I'm not checking for a couple of days. and so it became an issue. How do you, how do you, uh, can you explain that whole, the optional folder process? And then, hello, balloon. <laughs> I don't know why this balloon like, was following me around. Let's be the bald head. Yeah. Um, uh, and then, like, how do you solve, how do you prevent issues like what I just kind of explained there, described? So can, can you share just like at a very high level, what kind of email it was that you actually wanted to read? Uh, it was a CRM. It was from my CRM. Um, right. service, but they did, it does say, uh, manage your subscription. Manage your subscription. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. So look, I, I have, I have four kids, um, which means that there's all sorts of activities, school emails, all sorts of things that have that might be in them, but I still need to get them. So, uh, the unsubscribe filter needs to have, except needs to have exceptions to it. Mm-hmm. Right. So there's filter and you know, people don't know what we're talking about. I, I recommend that people have a filter in their email. that says that if an email has the word unsubscribe in it, it does not go to the inbox. It skips the inbox. It goes into an optional folder, which you can check when you want to, if you want to. But you want to have, you know, doesn't have the following words, such as like your kid's school or the CRM company or whatever it is, or like my company, you know, because uh, I want to be able to get my newsletters, of course. So uh, <laughs> you, you, I, I think that my filter probably has like 30 or 40 exception phrases in it. Oh, which wow, I just that many. Added over time. Yeah. Okay. Do you just add them over time because you realize that this, like, it didn't, it didn't catch this one, so now I need to add another exclusion. Yeah, and I mean, generally speaking, uh, I'm I'm in a like the habit enough now that if my kids take on a new activity or something like that, like I I look for the email essentially, and if it's if it's not uh, in my actual folder, or if it is in my actual folder, then I'll I'll add that to the. Uh, exceptions, but it's, it's a rarity. I'd say probably add a new exception, like once a year. Mm. Yeah. Email. So we had someone on the uh, show that was an inbox, essentially an inbox assistant and to Mm. help organize, because I didn't realize all the functionality. Now I don't use Outlook, but I use G Suite, like all the functionality that exists within your inbox, because I was just using it for okay, if I'm going to save this, I'm going to put it in some folder, which I never go back to and never look at it again. And it wasn't a pro, it wasn't a productive place. It was just like, just trying to like keep my head above water. And like within a month, I've learned a lot of tips and different ways to label things and make sure they stand out of like required actions or do this with this thing and become a productive workplace versus just a, well, it sits there because I don't want to lose it type of thing. Um, I don't know if you have any resources or places for people, like if they want to learn more about how to make their inbox productive where they can go for that. Yeah, I, uh, I do. And, but I, I do want to point out something really important to, in terms of regarding what you just said, which uh, for everybody to like really recognize is that what you just said is really not about the email. It's not about being more productive than specifically. It's really about having control and being more active versus passive in the tools and the things that we use in life. And in our business, right? So in your case, you know what you're talking about, right? Is the the before is basically like the inbox was like the thing that you kind of like avoided, and didn't want to really see, you know, like peeking over the desk for. Uh, but and that's controlling you. Uh, whereas the way you have it now is like you have taken control of it and taken it by the reins, essentially. And control ultimately is, is, is the antidote to stress and the antidote to overwhelm, uh, because a lot of overwhelm is just because we've let, essentially been like taken up by the tide. And we're just going with it, trying to, as you said, keep your head above water. Uh, so we need to be able to take control. And the inbox is a great place to start. Uh, in terms of the resources, I, I'm, I believe, I'm pretty sure on my website, unless doing.com, there is a free like inbox zero course. It's not very complicated. I, I'm sure you've seen that now. It's just that a lot of people don't attempt it because or you don't know where to, you just don't know where to go. Uh, yeah. Like I think, like once I, once I started figuring out how to do these things, it became pretty. It's not difficult. Um, it's just figuring out what those things are and then what 
like looking myself in the mirror when these messages come in, what kind of messages need to go into like a task to click up type folder or, or a label or, you know, keep on hand research newsletters, like put stuff in the, the kind of like an optional thing where like, Hey, maybe once a week I spend an hour and I go through the, all the newsletters that I want to keep, but I don't necessarily need to read today. Um, and it's, it's made thing because otherwise I would keep passing over this. I would keep scanning over the same inbox and the same emails, trying to make sure I didn't miss anything. I was spending like hours a day in there instead of, <laughs> you know, look at it, get what needs to be done and then move on to a project or something that actually needs my attention to grow our business. Well, and the other key there, which I know you guys do because you've told me about this before is that the best way to deal with email is to rely on email less, right? So you guys are using Slack and Boxer and Teams and whatnot. Uh, and you need that. Uh, and I think that uh, people try to do too much in email, right? They want to have that be like their, their task manager and their calendar and the place where they do the three different businesses that they run. Like it, email is really not well set up for that kind of thing. You need to have multiple different types of communication tools for different types of communication. That's a good point. And I love, I love that you said that there so we can kind of segue, segue into the, uh, the asynchronous uh, communication. Can you explain what that is? Like that's a big thing in your world um, and why it's, why it's a, such a big thing for you. So if I was going to say like the number one productivity weapon in my arsenal is asynchronous communication, right? So that, that's the opposite of what we're doing here right now, obviously. And, well, maybe not obviously, right? So for, for, for people who aren't don't know what I'm talking about, right? So synchronous would be like, we're in the room together. We're having this live conversation. I talk, you respond, you talk, I make a facial expression, you react to that, <laughs> we go back and forth, right? So, and there's a time and a place for that, but it's few and far between. Uh, and too many people try to make too many interactions synchronous because that's just the way they've always done it. And for a whole host of reasons, not the least of which is that different people just have different circadian rhythms and different times of the day that they do things and different moods that they might be in. So to get two people, much less five or six uh, in a meeting together, it's just very, very unlikely, if not impossible, that you're going to get those people at their best. Whereas with asynchronous communication, you're allowing people to communicate when and where is most effective for them. Sort of naturally, that's what happens. And that could be... Uh, it could be text message or it could be email, but even though those are technically asynchronous tools, most people don't use them that way because the way that most people or a lot of people will text someone is they'll, they'll write the text right with their phone and they kind of like stare at the phone waiting for the three bubbles. to you know, <laughs> go. And that's, are they going to respond to me or what? <laughs> right, right, exactly. And that's taking your attention away. So that's not, whereas if you use it correctly, you write the text message, you put it down, you go back to what you were doing because you're the master of your own time, generally. Hopefully, right? That's all right. Cool. All right. That's that's how you get in trouble with your wife real fast. My wife is not, my wife is on Voxer. <laughs> yeah, that's uh that that whenever I do that, um, that's it. That is literally how I'll text, and then I'll come back to like a thousand messages on that, and it's like, oh shoot, that's my bad because I and that's really. That's the point of my autoresponder. And I understand and I agree with what you said. I, don't, I am all about, you know, uh, pivoting and, and improving on processes and everything. Uh, but that I wanted, I guess I wanted my inbox to be more asynchronous, asynchronous versus it being synchronous and like requiring an immediate response from the email um, that's being sent to me. Well, and, but to that extent, right, there's certain, so there's a bunch of different ways to sort of bisect the way you communicate urgent versus non-urgent is certainly one asynchronous versus synchronous. Um, so I would, you know, you would never email 911 if somebody was breaking into your house, right? right. So why, right. why is that the tool that people are like, you know, this is, this is unacceptable. You need to get back to me right now. It's like, no, those are, those are the very few situations where I will pick up a phone and call somebody and, you know get an immediate response if that's what I need. But most things don't require that. And the other thing is that it's very rare that one person's urgent is another person's urgent. Exactly. Yeah. So and to and to that extent, like it is really important that every interaction you have with somebody over in terms of communication is a uh, a training opportunity. 
right? In terms of how they can and should communicate with you. And that's not to say that like everyone's the boss in every situation, but you, uh, what, uh, Tony Robbins, uh, he always used to say, he had this uh, saying, which was like, you don't, get, you don't get, uh, what you deserve. You get what you tolerate. Mm. Right. And so it's like, uh, I, so a good example, very simple example on my voicemail. If you call my phone, the voicemail says like, Hey, it's already myself. Um, if you want to leave me a message, it might be a while before I get back to you. If you want a more, uh, immediate response or a fast response, send me an email. Here's the address. Um, I have had multiple people, including like friends who have sent me or called me, they get the voicemail, call me, get the voicemail and, uh, and I won't respond. And, <laughs> but I'm very careful about this because the second I get an email from that person, those are the times when I will interrupt something else to respond to that email. Because mm, just like that, train oh, them. yeah, you train them. Just train like them how you want to be communicated with. They'll never call you again. Interesting. Good point. That is and a really I, good point. So I am definitely not saying remove the human element from your interaction with your clientele. This is exactly the opposite. Everything that I'm talking about here is about getting rid of all the other stuff that doesn't make you more human and the stuff that prevents you. Be, you know why? Because this is all the stuff that's like, ah, I really would love to call. The a, a perfect example is actually I've worked with a bunch of dentists and there is a fairly common practice among, I don't know why dentists as opposed to doctors, but dentists particularly will often call every patient that they saw that day at the end of the night. Just I had mine. Them. Mine does that. Yeah. So they're actually, I've spoken to a couple of dental mastermind groups and they really like push that as a thing you should huh. do. So okay. here's the thing. It's like, first of all, you can't do that if you're, like dealing with email till you know nine o'clock at night. You can't make those calls, but there's actually a way to automate that too, which just makes it uh, all the more human. But the point of all of this stuff is to shed away the stuff that is getting in the way of you bringing that human element to where it really should be. Because customer journey is a huge focus of mine in everything that I do with uh, with clients yeah. and the business I interact with. So, so what I hear you saying is that you begin less doing of everything else so that you can do more of so you can client. focus on that journey you know yeah. that customer journey and that service and that level of service so you can actually get real stuff done not just while well, i was busy today mm -hmm. you know not get rid of the busy work type stuff and actually get things that are really important to your business or your life done at least that's that's what i'm hearing as well yeah i yeah, know and, and that's the whole point about the replaceable founders we want to be as replaceable as possible right we're not i'm not i say that very clearly in the book i'm not trying to replace people we want to make you more replaceable by getting rid of all these other things that you can optimize on and outsource mm -hmm. so that the thing that you actually are unique at that you're good at that you like doing you can do more of and in that way be more effective so can, can we oh, go, go ahead josh go ahead josh <laughs> so i was going to say since you you, you mm -hmm. mentioned optimize automate outsource processes is something that uh, I think uh, in general, most businesses struggle with, but contractors, especially since they're in the truck, a lot of these guys are in the truck, they're in a service call, they're still doing installs, they're taking phone calls. Like building processes is not what they deem the most important thing of their day. So how, like if, if they were to get started, like trying to figure out what things they could start building a process around and things that they could start delegating to somebody else, whether it's a VA that doesn't work full time or maybe someone that works for them in the office or something, where would you, do you have some tips or anything that you'd recommend starting to like internally look at so they can start figuring out what those things are. But also would you mind going through, I think it was this book. I think it, uh, I can't remember cause I've read several back to back and over again, but there was one that you that you mentioned about uh, creating the process or the video or mm -hmm. something and then yeah. sending it to a VA. Can you go through that as well? Yeah, absolutely. So so just to give some sort of background context here, right? I'll, I'll give you a, a very relevant example. Um, so as I said, I, I've worked in, I think I've worked in just about every trade there is at this point. And I remember when I was just starting out and I was essentially apprenticing for a Mason who was, I want to say like late sixties, maybe. And he was like third generation. Like this was, this guy was, you know, born with mortar in his blood, basically, <laughs> essentially. Uh, and he taught me how to, how to lay brick and how to build walls and things like that. And 
but the way he did it was very much like the way a lot of apprenticing is done, right? Which was like sort of show me step by step and kind of copy him and mirror him and do what he was doing. Uh, and there's a problem with that, right? So he'd been, he it, he could do it in his sleep, right? Which means that there's all sorts of shortcuts and things that he uses and does that he can't fully explain mm -hmm. uh, or even recognize that he's using. So I, I, I was, I think I was fine, but I, I remember very clearly, like the first time I had to build a curved brick wall, I, I couldn't figure out how to do it because he hadn't shown me, right? And he hadn't shown me specifically how to do that. And he also he hadn't sort of imparted like a, a sort of implicit knowledge in terms of how to, how to, you know, like I could snap a line. That was fine. You know, and I, I could like, set that, no problem. But then to start doing a curve, like it's a whole other ball game. Oh yeah. Um, and obviously like you, you, so I didn't have the tools to figure out how to do the next step and how to innovate and things like that. So mm -hmm. that's how a lot of processes are done. Right. A lot of people will say, here's here's me doing the thing. And that thing could be, you know, paying a bill on QuickBooks or it could be laying brick mm -hmm. or running a manufacturing plant at a car like an auto plant, which I've, I've done that, too. I mean, I've, I've, I've <laughs> told it that uh, and they'll show you and they're like, all right, this is the process. Now, now do it, which is the same thing as somebody writing down the process and then giving it to you and say, go ahead and do it. So that's how it's typically done. I reverse that what i call my process optimization system unfortunately pos so <laughs> it basically flips that around and basically says you do the process and show it to somebody however you're going to show it to them but tell them to then write the checklist that they saw right and once they do that give it to ideally a third person and have them run through the process and it will never ever work which is great because now we can start to fix it at a very granular level. So as opposed to if in the bricklaying example, as opposed to saying like, all right, we take the mud, we do this, we do that, we do this, we do that, go back and forth. I should have just watched him do it mm -hmm. and then been like, all right, well, it looks like he's taking his trowel and doing this. And, you know, and then if I were to go explain it to somebody, and they went to build a wall, I'm sure that wall would have fallen over. <laughs> yeah. Right? And that's okay because then that first person can look at them doing it and be like, whoa, 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 stop there. You got to step two. You forgot to, you know, uh, set the line properly, right? Or you got to step four, the, the mud's too thick, you know, like mm -hmm. wh whatever it might be, as opposed to uh, the, the other way around. So now we get to fix things at a very granular, granular level. And what we usually see when people design processes the sort of traditional way is that they'll often refer to assets in a relative sense. So for example, uh, so you're doing like a payroll process, right? Mm -hmm. uh, open the payroll, uh, step two, open the payroll document for November. And the person, this third person now doing this is like, well, it's January right now, first of all, and where is that payroll document anyway? Yeah, right. Yeah, so where we find it. right. So where do we find it? So the, the person has to, you have to change that to an absolute sense, meaning like step two, open this link, right? Or here is the document attached, whatever it might be. And we get down to you know step seven, and it says, okay, well, now you have to uh, click the big red button, right? And the person's like, well, I don't, I don't have a big red button. And they're like, oh, <laughs> right, because you're you're a guest, I'm an admin. I get okay, so I have to change the permissions in the process or give you a password. And then the other thing that happens a lot is that we'll refer to people in an absolute sense, so the opposite. So we get to step, you know, 20, and it's like, all right, now we're done with the process. You know, give the paperwork to Jan in accounting. You're like, you know, Jan quit last week, so yeah. now what? You're like, okay, <laughs> so we have to make it relative. It needs to be a role, not a person. You want to make somebody irreplaceable? Name them in a process. Yes, I love that. And so let me clarify something here to make sure that I'm um, – hearing you correctly uh the the first step there is to have the person have the person that does it all the time do the process with someone else watching it or because here's what i've done in the past and i'm and i might have caused myself more work by doing this uh so i would have the person that normally does it create like a loom or a, a zoom recording screen recording of it and then sending that recording to like a VA to transcribe like the steps out. Uh, is that okay? Or do we yeah, have no, to? No. Okay. That's okay. Fine. Okay. Yeah. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Right. You, you, okay. you, you can show somebody however you want. It could be a screencast. It could be in person. It could be a, 
in the industrial processes I've worked on with people, you're, you're like videoing them sometimes. Yeah. Right? So, and then, but don't give them the instruction, just show them, show them the process. Yeah. And then you see like, <laughs> so I did this one time with a uh, Dext, what used to be receipt bank and uh, we we're capturing receipts and then exporting them with QuickBooks and all of that. And it was like, Oh, you missed, like you didn't, explain this step because now this like receipt just magically appeared here so we don't we had no idea where this stuff go and it's like wow I, like there's a lot of steps in here really uh and and so yeah I, I i find amazing value in that um that aspect of it but um we don't have a whole whole lot of time but would you mind kind of at a high level go through like the nine fundamental principles of less doing? Yeah, I just have to address one thing here with Everett. Um, so I, I am born and raised New York. I've been in New Jersey for a year now. So uh, if, I, if I seem like I'm from New Jersey, I don't, I'm not sure. Everett, I'm not he's taking from, it badly. I'm not taking it badly. New Jersey. I, guess, I just adopted, I guess, pretty quickly. Um, so the nine fundamentals of less doing, that's, that's, uh, that's what you want? Yeah, yeah. High level. I mean, because we could go in deep in the weeds with it. I mean, uh, I would. It, well, so the, so here's the thing. I could do that. But the, less doing was the original and it was much more personal. Oh, OK. Yeah. No, no, much more personal productivity focus, whereas the replaceable founder uh, also has nine principles. But it's more. Yeah, let's stop there. Things might be more relevant. So yeah, yeah, the, yeah, let's the, the three main categories are communication, project management, and uh, processes. Within those, within communications, we've got inbox zero, right? Which is, well, inbox zero is really not about the inbox. The, in, the email problem is a decision-making problem. So inbox zero is, uh, it's actually, it's not called that even in the in the book. It's called the three decisions. So three the three decisions. It's about making more effective decisions. Uh, the second one is asynchronous communication, which we talked about. Mm -hmm. And the third one is the six levels of delegation, right? So with that one, I'm basically teaching that a lot of people have this very binary approach to delegating, meaning like I do everything or they do everything. And neither one is a, is a great scenario for most of them. So the six levels uh, is exactly that. There are six very various uh, deepening levels of delegation, which you can use in different uh, settings. Uh, under project management, we get into uh, radical transparency, which is really about making it very clear and showing what people are working on, when, where, who's responsible for what, without requiring like micromanagement and the communication that goes along with that. Mm -hmm. The project management sort of schema itself. And then uh, the third one is, I'm, uh, <laughs> no, I'm uh, huh? I said, you're good. You're good. I understand. Yeah, so I, I probably should know what that third one is, but I will figured that one out in a second. Um, <laughs> it's been a while since I wrote the book. And then the uh, the third one is uh, processes, which is optimizing, automating housewives. So optimizing, and that order is really important. We have to optimize first with a look at what we have, what we're using, the resources and whatnot, and uh, make them more effective to begin with because a lot of people will try to outsource first as like a knee-jerk reaction. And that I've and done I, that too. Very common. It's very common. I don't want to deal with this thing. Like, let me get somebody to deal with it. And then they don't know how to deal with it because you don't know how to deal with it. And, mm -hmm. and yet you're expecting them to have a better result than you would have had. It's like a recipe for failure and then automating. So we're going to automate whatever we can before we get to people um, and automation. And I know you guys like it. So yeah. triggers and actions, right? Uh, and then uh, the last one is, is outsourcing or delegating. Right? So at that point, when we really want to be able to delegate effectively to different people, uh, whether they're in the company or out, the, out of the company to, to get more of these things done. That's, uh, and I know you can go really deep with a couple of these things. Um, how, I don't know if we can in a fairly quick sense, go over like what, what types of things do you look to automate versus delegate and, and the breakdown between those two, because I think that's, that, uh, that gets confusing for people because what needs a human touch versus what, doesn't necessarily need that human touch. So uh, nothing, all, I would say just about almost nothing needs a human touch. So that is a really important thing okay. because, because if we don't see it that way, then it's kind of, it's kind of limiting. Uh, and 
there's so many things like that where people feel like, oh, it's got to be me or it's got to be a person. Or it's got to be this, this person with all yeah. this experience and it can't be done. And they may be somewhat right, but oftentimes they're not. And again, if we, if we seek that replaceability, ultimately what you're going to do with that person that has all the experience and everything is you're going to replace them up, not out. They're going to be able to do yeah. better, bigger things. So the, we, I mean, the, the, the simple answer is we want to try to automate everything, really, because if we do that, whatever's left over, that's going to be the thing that a person's going to need to do for now. So Quite there's simple. there's not a point to where we automate too much? No, not, not if you're doing it in this way where we're trying to enhance the human element. Because if you look mm -hmm. at most businesses, especially in service mm -hmm. businesses, and the word service is right there, right? <laughs> that's the first thing that goes when people get busy. Yeah. The first thing yeah. is the yeah. customer service, the customer experience, the... Uh, the, the, the because that takes the most time. I mean, yeah. it takes the most time to be a, like to really be thorough with your process and make sure that you're listening and all that kind of stuff. It really takes a focus level. It's also it's, it's also the messiest part of it. Yeah. Right? So look, I'll give you a really good example that just happened to me today. We're we're, we're getting a pool installed, um, which has been a many month process, as, which I, I knew that would be the case. Um, a month ago, uh, the electrician who was subcontracted, and they were great, they came out and they put in the uh, the wiring and all the system for the the, um, the filter system and whatnot. And they had to run an Ethernet cable to my house because there's a Wi-Fi controller for the thing. And the guy told me, this is on February 23rd, he said the, the controller, the Wi-Fi controller seems to be defective. And, you, you know, do something. It's not. You should talk yeah. to the company. So I... Tech, I talked to the owner of the pool company immediately, and he's like, he's like, yeah, can you just do me a favor and email the office because I'm not going to remember, which that's <laughs> fine. I get it. He, that's he delegating. Yeah. I, email, I emailed the office and uh, realized I never heard back. And so today they came to start up the pool, and the guy's like, hey, the Wi-Fi controller is not working. Yeah, and I, I, I got very upset. <laughs> um, and so I contacted the project manager for the at the pool company, and I was like, this happened. I sent you this email five weeks ago, letting you know this was happening. And she said, like, I'll, you know, I'll get back to you. I'll, I'll get right back to you or something like that. And I called her about an hour later because she hadn't gone back to me. And she was like, um, I need to do this. I need to figure whatever. She didn't really tell me anything. And I said, yeah. like, this is, I'm, this is very frustrating. And I'm not happy with this. Um, and the thing is, when I do that, like I'm coming from a place of like, I'm actually going to help you make your business better, <laughs> even, though, even though I'm pissed off at you right now. Yeah. But um, I could hear in the background, like phones were going off. Somebody else was talking to her, you know, and I get it. She got busy uh, trying, and, and maybe she's diligently trying to figure out what the problem is right now and talking to the company, but she's not communicating any of that thing to me because she's overwhelmed. Yeah. Or, or she's afraid that you're, that you're going to think less of her because she is overwhelmed and uh yeah no i agree 100 <laughs> percent um so uh ever one just a second ago ever right, i just want kind of some more thing <laughs> yeah say yeah, all you please. want to yeah. keep going the the it, it's very simple the the absolute worst thing that you can do from a customer experience point of view is to keep your customers in the dark that's it and it's also in some people's businesses, it is the hardest thing to stay on top of because you're busy. And even if you're calling somebody to be like, hey, uh, you know, the lead, uh, the lead time on that, <laughs> we had a generator installed for our house. The uh -huh. lead time originally was 26 weeks because of COVID and all sorts of yeah, stuff. Yeah, 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 like, I believe it. I was like, 26 weeks? I was like, we could be living in another city at that point. <laughs> you know, and it's like, but they gave me an update every week, even though there was no mm. update. They're like, we Come checked on. with them again still 26 weeks check with them again and i was happy with that and it ended up coming a lot earlier anyway but it, it, a lot of times it's like well i didn't want to say anything because we didn't know anything it's like well yeah. then i'm just going to fill in the blanks with assuming that you know you're not you following up you don't money. care yeah. right yeah that's something that's that's definitely i've seen that within when that within our team here recently where uh we were checking on a part that was back ordered and it was an evaporator coil. Uh, it was actually for the Savannah bananas. And um, it was a, they had to manufacture it at the manufacturer's level. And so we were called, we were calling every single week, 
but we were not notifying the team over there every single week that we were calling them and we hadn't heard anything back yet, or they haven't given us an update. And uh, they didn't complain to us. They're wonderful people. Um, but as soon as I realized we had not been communicating with them, I was like, okay, we, I really want you like, this is our process. We need to make sure we're over communicating. If it feels like we're over communicating, they probably feel like we're communicating just enough. Uh, Absolutely. And so we, we, that happened. And anyways, it, I, it was exactly the same thought. Like she was busy ordering parts and making sure parts were getting here and everything else that uh, didn't really take the time to in, uh, include that part of the process into her daily routine, which is now part of the daily processes. But I mean, it, it, you know, at the very basic level, it's just a matter of like, I don't have the solution but I promise you I'm going to find the solution and I'm going to let you know what's happening either way in X amount of time. Yeah. That's it. Yep. Yeah. So what, so we had a couple of uh, Everett and Cheryl. So what, what book, if somebody wanted to kind of start, cause you have a couple of books, is there one that you would recommend starting with? Probably the replaceable founder. I mean, the last one is on productivity, which uh, is supposed to be sort of my like, final book on productivity. I don't know I want to write anymore at this point. Um, <laughs> the final hoorah. It, yeah, it's a little it's a little higher level, I think, in some ways. The Replaceable Founder is pretty tactical. So I would say the Replaceable Founder slash uh, on productivity. So and that is, uh, for people that list, that are listening, that is an audio book. Uh, I think you actually, you do the audio yourself. So um, that is an audio book. It's just in case that's the way you want to listen, if you don't want to read it. Uh, cause I know Tersh and I both, we would prefer to listen than read. So, um, but we, we had one more question in here somewhere. Um, uh, someone on Facebook said, this is a great topic. What process can you implement to help keep your people? So they're not, I'm assuming feeling overwhelmed is what he meant to say. A lot of the overwhelm that people experience is just a, a lack of understanding of where the overwhelm is coming from, which I know sounds very circular, but we tend to keep more in our heads than we really should, right? So if we're creating processes where people are offloading and like sort of brain dumping, right? Even in a service business, right? You finish a job, you got to run to the next job, but there's nothing wrong with there being a 30 second or even a one minute process of sort of like recapping what you just did. Mm -hmm. You know, and obviously people got to fill out tickets and things like that, but if somebody is truly that busy, that overwhelmed, like set it up so that they can call a phone number and leave a voicemail for a minute that then gets transcribed. And that's the notes for the call. Uh, mm, that's something that like a debrief. That's yeah, a debrief. Idea. Um, so it, 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 that's the thing is we need to have processes where people can sort of uh, not keep things in their head. Really. That's, that's what it is. Um, Cheryl, the, the second book is on productivity. It's the most recent book. This one here. Yeah. And it is very good. And, um yeah we've we learned a ton from that um the so really quick to wrap things up could you give us less on the business side more on the the personal side a couple of uh things that you would recommend someone do in their personal life to to help um you can't i wouldn't say replace them replace it. I don't know what the best thing to say is, but just their yeah, personal uh, productivity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so again, honestly, asynchronous communication is the biggest one and it, it's, it's so true in personal life. Uh, in, even in that, personal life. Absolutely. 99% okay. of my conversation, I think at this point are done uh, asynchronously. Uh, it's how I keep in touch with a lot of my friends and I, I it's even how I talk to my, my mother. Uh, and <laughs> we, we talk more over boxer than used to be with a phone call because uh, I'm not, I wouldn't consider myself a busy person. I have a very full life. I'm always doing something. Like I'm never, I'm never idle. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So stopping and getting on the phone is just, it, it's not something I want to be doing. Right. Yeah. So um, more and more asynchronous communication, as I said, like this, this call that we're having right now is the only synchronous meeting I have on my schedule the entire week. That's why. So, uh, that, yeah, I mean, that's that's the biggest one. I'm not, uh, I, I'm texting with contractors that are working at the house. Like, I'm not mm -hmm. really, try, I try to avoid phone calls as much as possible because I'm not going to remember things. I'm not going to keep track and uh, I'm, I'm going to be focused on other things. So 
Uh, that's a big one. Uh, but then the other one, which is really huge in personal life, particularly too, is idea capture. So, uh, and that's, by the way, that was the third one in product, in, uh, product <laughs> management. I forgot, idea capture, uh, external brain is what it's called. Before. External brain, yes. Yeah. Evernote. I, I reintroduced Evernote into my life a couple weeks or two ago, and it's like, what? Like, why have I not <laughs> had this in my life for so many years? Well, so I actually use Trello for a lot of that functionality at this point. Uh, okay. And Evernote, Evernote's still great, but the, the bigger thing is how you get the ideas in there, right? So I... Basically, I'm never 20 seconds away, more than 20 seconds away from being able to capture an idea. So I've got Alexa devices in every stop. Um, <laughs> right. Um, so if I ask her to uh, add something to my uh, to do list, I believe it will then turn into a card in my Trello. Um, if, I take, if I take a screenshot on my phone, uh, it will become a like Trello that. card. Right. If I send a text message to a specific phone number or a voicemail to that number, those will. Right. So no matter where I am at any time, and I even have um, this person you know, <laughs> right in my, in my car. There's the uh, auto version. So um, I, which means that I'm never holding on to ideas that and like taking up space and getting distracted with them. I offload them and then I process them later at a set time. Now, what do you what are you using to. Um, to put that stuff into Trello from uh, that device. How are you? Yeah, how are you connecting that device? We'll just say to to those different things. Yeah, um, IFTTT. So if this, then that. Yeah, uh, is the okay. app that does that. And uh, I, so I use Zapier for most automation, but it's it's uh, Zapier is definitely more focused on business uh, apps and services, whereas IFTTT actually does a lot of the Internet of Things. Uh, kind of stuff. So even like light switches in the house that are like mm -hmm. Wemo switches or whatnot, if you long press a certain switch, like that can trigger something on IFTTT, which is pretty cool. Wow. Yeah. So wow. there, there's some really fun, well, really useful things that you can do on the personal side with IFTTT. Now with that, it's like we, we actually put in our RSS feed from the website to go to send automatically out to, to Trello. I mean, to, uh, to Twitter uh, as soon as, any kind of new blog post or updated or anything like that. So we, we have a, we have a, a lot of the IFTTT stuff set up um, automatically. Now, is there a reason why you want, why you move away from Evernote towards Trello? Because I, the thing about Evernote that I really like is the fact that like I put a note in there and then it adds it to my to-do list kind of thing. Uh, no. So I was using Trello as more of a knowledge repository, less so for like, active ideas and tasks. So it'd be, uh, Evernote for me was more like, here's an interesting article that I might reference at some point. Yeah. Uh, and because the searchability in Evernote is amazing. And it, it and again, it's, it's totally, I recommend it for what you're talking about. But for me, nowadays, a lot of the stuff that I come up with is just very, very like task based, you know, like I need to get this thing, I need to fix this or this, whatever it is. And for me, like Trello is just sort of a quick hit for those kinds of things. Gotcha. Now, how often those screenshot cards that you're going through, how often are you looking at those? Like once a day? Uh, nightly, generally. Oh, okay. So for me, it's uh, it, it's like one of my sort of night routine things is to, to sort my uh, Trello cards for the day. Cool. All right. Like, we really appreciate you coming on the show and we want to respect your time. Uh, and okay. if, if somebody wants to reach out to you, learn more about you, where is it again where we need to go? So everything's at lesdemeanor.com, but uh, anybody who's welcome to get in touch with me directly, you can go to voxwithra.com, and that will explain how to get in touch with me on Voxer. And it's really me. It's not that's automation. Cool. It's not an assistant. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and um, that's where I, I, I love uh, I love Voxer. So anyone, really, if you have a question, something like that, feel free to reach out. Cool, man. We really appreciate it, 100%. Thanks, Thanks for Ari. This was great. We'll see you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Service Business Mastery. Now that you are equipped with essential business advice from this impactful conversation, you are one step closer to becoming the successful owner of your dreams. If this episode has been helpful to your business journey, don't forget to subscribe to the show, leave a rating, and share it with other owners as well. Visit servicebusinessmastery.com to learn more.